Blitz is defined as a sudden, savage attack. It is indeed all this. The effect is sure. The premise is simple. It's a basic, primal confrontation, man to man. No excuses are offered. None except. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts, Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete, yeah. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk <laughs> shit, man. I back it up. And we are chock full of that, man. That's right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Because Stone Cold said so. If you're going to blitz, come strong. But don't come at all. We're going to come strong with another edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com, but man, we've had better weeks to do a show. <laughs> Texas loses the regular season finale to Texas Tech 27-23. I don't know how, but we're going to talk about how Texas got in this position. From Have we had a week where we've done two shows that have been just the complete opposite of each other this close <laughs> together? Like last week, we were all optimistic and feeling mm-hmm. good after West Virginia, and then that turd sandwich got plopped on the plate the day and night after Thanksgiving. Yeah, right? Yep. Exactly. Right. Uh, it, it's a good way of putting it. I like the phrasing there. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of right how the beginning of the season began is con- yeah, how so- the end ended. You know, it sort of yeah. – you, you had it out of nowhere. It was crap, and then it got pretty good but sort of fooled you. Then you thought you were still fooled, but then it went to back to crap. So it right. bookended – the season very well. It ended and began the same way. That's not well. <laughs> That's not well. That's no, not no. a good thing. But for booking, you're supposed to have definition. gotten better throughout the season, right. and essentially that. Yes. And that I'm glad Matt brought it up the way he did because I talked about it too on my show. The season began and ended almost in the same way. The only difference really was the, the quarterbacks were different who started those games for Texas and. I will say that, um, uh, you know what, I, you know what, other, and, then, and then maybe the uh, the the the, 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 call, the culture and the style of play, I guess, because yeah. of the Big Twelve. But other than that, the optimism was the same. It was Texas fans being they were very optimistic at the beginning of the season. They were very optimistic after that West Virginia game about closing out the season potentially, you know, uh, with seven wins instead of six wins. Uh, also. You look at you know the the uh, you know the the way Texas was uh, I was like unable to run the football versus Maryland also unable to run the football versus Texas Tech and they were out coached in the Maryland game also out coached in the Texas Tech game and Texas Tech was more physical than Texas at times which was mind blowing and also Maryland was also more physical than Texas at times there are a lot of similarities you know randomly thrown in uh-huh. here that's yeah. a great point no man. and what the funny thing about it is it's sort of like you can have a good, great meal but at the last bite you take is right? rotten food like you get left with this rotten taste that you only remember you totally sort of throw out what was good because it doesn't have that momentum so just this odd situation you don't have many seasons happen that way luckily you at least won that game in West Virginia somehow, so then you can have this bowl season to maybe be able to resurrect it or get some work out of it. But it's just a foul taste let, can let, really let me, make something spoil. Let me time. preface this before people listen, get upset, and like, oh no, there's a difference. We know we knew what the defense was an elite defense by the time we got to Texas Tech. That may be the only difference. We knew mm-hmm. the defense was an elite defense right. at that point. Absolutely. And we knew the offense was inept, but the West Virginia game gave us so much hope and optimism that in, Je- in Texas Tech, they do it all the time. Those 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 SOBs, they, man. <laughs> they they spoil it for us. I, got, oh, I was on the 40 career, Acres in 2002 yes. when we had a chance potentially to play in a national title game. We would have played in the Big 12 championship. We, yes, exactly. And then contend for a national title. We lose at Texas Tech at night in Lubbock. Of course, 2008, you know, everybody knows that. I'm not going to get into it. And then now, a lot of people optimistic about the way Tom Herman's first season was going to end, and Texas Tech spoils it and saves Cliff Kingsbury's job in the process. Yeah, it was a worst-case scenario imaginable for the regular season finale. And we'll talk more about it here in a little bit. But, you know, offensively, like you said, Rod, the optimism coming out of the West Virginia game was, okay, now we see this offense, even as limited as it is, has a blueprint. There is a path to victory and to success 
with the personnel you have if you just follow it. And I've never, th- th- just like the Maryland game, I've never seen an offensive staff so impatient and so quick to abandon the run. Abandon. And just Done. completely just start throwing stuff at the wall like this staff. Like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll give Sean Watson credit here. You guys know I'm not a big Sean Watson fan. <laughs> hey, Sean, Sean Watson, Watson had a big credit. moment this past weekend. Sean Watson's offense beat Manny Diaz's defense. There you go. Oh, that's oh, amazing. Oh, only Watch. Texas Ooh. fans appreciated that. Like, whoa, what the? You know what I'm saying, right? That's like pit. somewhere in a UT hell. Like, that is, that's a nightmare <laughs> of a Texas fan. Hey, it's like uh, that keeps Texas out of the title that's game. Great Pitt had sport, a freshman man. quarterback that didn't look too bad in that Miami game either. Yeah. But. Sean Watson, pit. Sean Watson at least had, you know, opening scripts that were great. We we talk about his scripting, like he'd script those first like really 20 good. to 25 plays. And man, you go back and look at that 2014 offense rod and some of them the, those first 20 plays that could lead into your second, maybe your third series and it's like, man, they really game plan well, they scouted well, their self scouting was really good. Yeah. But then after those 20 plays, everything just went to hell. Yep. This staff just seems like you've mentioned it last week. It just seems like they don't game plan very well. They don't scout very they well. Self-scout. They don't self scout very well. They just kind of go in hoping something's going to work, and when it doesn't, they yeah. panic. Man, that pucker factor in that press box is real. Is panics. real. Well, and yeah. that's the thing that you sort of talk about how you can really uh, gauge a player. Like, say, if a player thrives in chaos or makes good decisions in tough situations, then those are the indicators of success. And this is like basically the total opposite that whenever a coach, because a lot of coaches can game plan, that can be admin stuff, that can be numbers at a school like Texas or Alabama. That's why people say Saban is never out game playing because he always is prepared. Now, once you get into it, if you don't make those right decisions as a coach, once it comes down to those nine that are allowed to be up there making those decisions, that's whenever you can really learn more and more. And then once you get a full couple seasons of sample, it's easy to tell if you're going to be able to do it or not. And right now, now it doesn't look like you really been able to do anything this season to evolve your offense. It, 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 it was inter- reactive. Yeah, no, it's interesting because I remember you know you can obviously Jeff complaining about that Tim Beck hire, talking about Tim Beck's tendencies throughout mm-hmm. his coaching career, and he has had a tendency to lean heavily, almost uh, too much on the past. That's kind of his uh, when the fit hits the sham. That's what he relies on, and almost like what he his perfect vision, a utopian offense, would be that he would pass kind of almost more than he would run. Mm-hmm. And he has shown, and we talked about it in that Maryland game, and we've seen it throughout the season, um, maybe in like the Oklahoma State game and different games where it's been close for Texas, that Texas will at times abandon the run. Now, they don't really have a running game, so I'll I'll give him a, a lot of leeway because like, they don't have a running game. Right. Like, there's no reason for them to have faith in a running game because they don't have one. But you understand that the the stat that we talk about on this show, that if you run the ball 40 or more times for Texas, that they are 5-0. and uh, And when they don't, they are now 1-5 and after that game. There is something to it. Like, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying uh, it's an important stat, but if you think about – getting to know your offense intimately and knowing what you do well and your weaknesses and strengths, this coaching staff has failed to evaluate properly. Miserably. Yes. Miserably. Their, their weaknesses and strengths on offense, That's you know what? That goes back to the personnel issues, right? Yeah. The, we've said at times, not only does the offense lack creativity, and I'll give you a little – I'll listen, uh, creativity, everybody's creativity is different depending on – I don't know what the Tom Herman offense exactly is. None of us know. All right, so I don't know if this is it or this is remnants of it or they're doing as much as they can, but I do know this. Your offense lacks common sense a ton. You were on the, what was it, your two-yard line? Mm -hmm. First and goal? We're going to get started. Right, and and we're going to get – and the lack of common sense in some of of that play calling – I gotta tell you, I'm I'm dumbfounded. I'm it's, stupefied by it. it. And and we are in that that's week twelve. That's the last game of the season. So you still don't know who your personnel is. That's the worst you part. Still have no idea. That's the worst part. You got to the end. And you got to the end. The, if you sat this offensive staff down, sit them in a room right now, could they tell you what can we hang our hat on offensively from a scheme standpoint? Who who's our number one running back? Who are our three best receivers? 
And who's the best quarterback we have? Can they answer <laughs> any know, four of those questions honestly I hope and, they can answer and the without question? I hope they can answer the quarterback. Uh, yeah, Ellinger, I, I don't. Say that. I don't know for sure because Tim yeah. Beck's propensity to throw the football. He might think he likes Shane Bouchel better. Yeah. No, With no, the QB I run, I, I would say it'd be Ellinger, but your point is well made. It's right. across the point, and you know, uh, it, you know, it, running back and wide receiver for sure. It's just the indecisiveness, lack of identity, and then when you sort of had to, you know, put some pieces that weren't ready yet in it, makes it wor- look even maybe worse than it is. So, like, just I not can, good. I can understand. Oh, in I text, feel like I'm repeating myself. I, I can exactly. understand your first couple of weeks without Connor Williams, maybe trying to figure out what you do. Rod, you get to game 12 and you've got Connor Williams back and you still have no damn idea what you're doing on offense? And to your How po- does that happen? To your point last week when you said, and I think it was a, almost a revelation, that Connor Williams is the identity of the offense. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He's that damn good. And we'll talk about Connor Williams, who is obviously the class. And by the way, against Texas Tech, he had one of his worst games ever. He did have a If bad you look game. at the pro football yeah. focus numbers. He got some. Second worst calls. offensive yeah. lineman on the roster. I think his mind was elsewhere. I think we know now. Well, yeah, yeah. You see how <laughs> quick, we know how quick, now, that, how quick that decision was made? It's his like I am so a, close it, to it, being yeah. a millionaire. Yeah, I, mean, I am so close. Well, I, I, yeah. I mean, you can't even blame him. College baseball talks about that a lot of the time that. That's why a lot of their big time players don't have great college or ben World Simmons Series. And, and, uh, They've already checked out. Been they already drafted know. in the. They moved the yeah. draft. It used to be during like the Elite Eight or the Sweet Sixteen, the Super yeah. Regionals. Yeah, they're already done. They're checked out. So I, I agree with you on that. I think that's what it is. But you know, when we go back to, I, I didn't see him run behind Connor Williams a lot of the time. No, I was looking for them too. I was like, man, Connor Williams. They're just gonna run behind Connor. The Williams one time I saw them do it, Danny Young ripped off twenty five yards, and they never went back to. It. Exactly, I think they did it. Tech. Maybe I counted maybe four or five times that I said, oh, they, I think they intentionally ran behind Connor Williams. Matt, I don't know where you're going with that, but it's not like you're facing TCU. It's Tech. That's it's what Texas I'm saying. It's tech. Tech. It's, tech. it's like the last time we saw this, this was the Chris Warren break every record coming out party for him when he went for, what, 270 yeah. against him? It was like for the past yeah. three decades, you it's have ironic. broke records running the ball against the Tech. Ball. But that's sort of the one thing that we're talking about, that the longer vision, that when you see these things that, oh, well, maybe we aren't good at running. No. But indicators of success of 40 runs no. per game end up meaning they don't have the ball. We sustain stuff, no. and then we do that against Tech all the let's time. Talk, it works. Let's talk about the Shakespearean irony of this whole whole freaking thing, okay? Because yeah. Matt just brought it up and made a good point. Okay, so we have dominated Texas Tech. In the, running. And the antidote to dominate tech. Everybody knows it. It's to just beat the scout, hell out of them. How would you scout Be this? more physical than tech. Yes. All right? And then if you be more physical than tech, you'll punk them. You'll debo them. Yes. All right? At one point, and then tech will re- realize they're Texas tech, and they will count. Now, it doesn't always work out. If it's nighttime in Lubbock, <laughs> Might not. you know what I mean? It ain't, well, it ain't easy to do it. It's not Herman's easy. Football. Yeah, it's not easy to uh, impose your will on them, as you know I mean, as it is here in Austin, uh, you know what I mean, during the day. or that kind Where of their thing, coach right? is about to get fired. Exactly. Okay, so, but Matt just brought up, like, you know, Chris Warren had his greatest game ever two versus years Texas Tech two years ago. And it was, it was like, it was like, oh, my, it was like a, everybody realized we had an epiphany. This guy can be a beast if he's just running downhill on Big 12 defense Against lesser opponents. On, against DBs. lesser opponents. Yes. Exactly. Big yes. 12 defenses, pretty, pretty much. Because mm-hmm. as, as Iowa State, that's, you know, the Big 12 defenses. And him just running downhill because he's, he's a freak. He's 250-pound running back. And yet, against Texas Tech, he has de- deteriorated his stock to the point with his coaching staff where he is now playing H-back. And then, of course, he ends up retiring. And the I- no, ultimate irony is so good. No, no. And then, and then the other going. thing, uh, Armonte Foreman, a guy who was in the doghouse with Tom Harmon, ends up being the lead receiver in this game. And also the guy who – I know Kirk Bowles asked about it right after the game. Like, hey, what happened to Armonte Foreman? He was – dominating when you throw him the ball in the first half. And we like that, the short pot, short right, short right, passing game, the high percentage passing game where a guy can get yak yards. And Armonte Foreman, of course, looking like Deontay Foreman out there, getting yak yards, running through defenders at Tech. You're like, yeah, that's what you do to Tech, all right? Because Tech can't tackle. Tech ain't they, – they, 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 they're doing a good job of forcing turnovers this year. But they don't really have fundamentals. They don't have great They didn't techniques. suddenly become the 2000 Texas defense. No. Yeah. So my point is Armonte Foreman, who's in the doghouse, uh, and we get on Papa Foreman. I love Papa Foreman. Um, and Papa Foreman just he, he – He's in a fight. He it's like ball it versus hey, Trump. Hey, at this point, Papa Foreman's look – people are starting to jump on that bandwagon because 
I think a lot of things that he has been critical of with this Texas coaching regime yeah. have really come to fruition. We'll, we'll talk about that here. Right, we'll talk well, about that too. He listens so, to the show. He hears what we're exactly. talking about. So Armonte Foreman doing his thing, and yet he disappears. And it's like, whoa, whoa. Shouldn't you be trying to get to – when the guys if in a zone like that, get them the football. Mm-hmm. They on the, they're on the two-yard line with first and goal on multiple occasions. by, And then you never see a 250-pound running back Do you who realize? once ran for 200-plus well, yards on Texas to Tech. On in a sim- and you know what? I know you got a Tom Herman offense, but, hey, is there a play in there where like you can you just have this guy with a fullback in front of him and run right down here with the two Direct the snap it to him. Line. I don't yeah, care. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'll get it to him. I don't care. That's my point. It lacks common sense. Yes. The offense lacks common sense. And it's so ironic and almost nonsensical. They're now so when we damn look back, smart they're so, stupid. Yes. You know no, I mean? and, and look at this. They're that, so smart they're stupid. You look at Warren <laughs> and his best game's coming off of that, but yet we're like, okay, well, let's look at this team. Well, when are they most successful? Well, 40-plus carries. Okay, well, that aligns there. Well, let's look back. What's the identity of Tom Herman football? Well, what are we gonna we're going to be as physical as possible all preseason. We're changing up the mentality to be physical. And then physicality has been successful when doing it. Then the one opponent where you can almost blanketly say for 20 years in the Big 12, if you run at them, they're just, you're going to run them over and set records. And just, it might not work at the beginning, but by carry 40, sort of how it has all year, and how it always has against them. Yet you don't, and seeing those things to where you can understand that it doesn't work on the beginning, but the ideology, if you believe in physicality, if you believe in these things you preach for a whole year, that's the perfect game and perfect situation to take advantage of that, and they didn't. First and goal on a two. Rob, would you like to know the and ultimate irony? The ultimate irony with Chris Warren, and it's not irony, it's just sad. After that monster game against Texas Tech, his true freshman year, he never got another carry against Texas Tech in his career. <laughs> he was hurt last year, and he got zero carries in the game on Friday. And what, what was that game? Well, at least he got 276. 276. 276. He was like a sports center. <laughs> Yeah, for that game. he got he got in that game almost what the Texas leading rusher in through twelve regular season games had this year. That's why people were putting him on him and Deontay Foreman in the same category. We found out season off. Your is like nah 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 nah. Deontay's on a different level. De- Deontay's so damn good. You can Texas can be one dimensional and he can still run against defenses. That's why it was a good question on the show. I'll ask you guys because this is my theory. Um, who wins a game, a football game between Charlie Strong's first year? Making a bowl game, being six and six, and mm-hmm. uh, Tom Herman's first year, this bowl game being six and six. I think this team beats the twenty fourteen team. I agree too. I think yeah. Long Ball Dixon is the difference. Hell, <laughs> alone. No, seriously, Long Ball Dixon is a dude. Realize this. I was watching that game last night, the Texans and the Raiders. Nobody cares about the Texans. I understand, so I'll make it quick. All right, but the make Ra- this as quick as Tom Savage's press conference. <laughs> exactly. Right. I did not see that, but um, I guess it was quick. It was great. Um, but Justin Tucker's the kicker for the the Ravens, and he's arguably the best kicker in the league. Not arguably, ever. I think he is the best kicker in Most the league. No question. Ever in NFL and he's got like tricks. He's like unbelievable. And um, I, they they have, they have a really good punter too. I think his name is Sam Coke or something like that. Mm, he's really good too. But if Long ball Dixon leaves early, and he won't. But if he ends up going to the NFL in a couple of years, of course, and getting drafted, Texas may have the best punter and the kicker in the league by Perhaps. that time. Because um, he, he, right now, some of his numbers are as good as the punters in the league are even better. And while we're talking about kickers, Phil Dawson, 57-yard game winner. That was awesome to watch. 57 yards. Check this out, Rob. Chris, oh, Warren, Chris Warren had the 276 against Texas Tech two years ago. How about 314? For this entire season, wow, he's an H back. So we'll, we'll get to Patriots Chris. We'll, we'll, well, let's go ahead. Well, let me go ahead. Let's go ahead because I haven't introduced the team. And for those first time listeners, I like to let everybody know about the team here at Longhorn Blitz. I am Jeff Howell. I'll be taking you through this adventure. What we got left, which about forty minutes or so thereabouts. Uh, he is the master of the soundboard, the drop machine extraordinaire. No longer the man behind the glass, the man that sits across from me, who once again made a good yard bird for my Thanksgiving. Nice. Matt Butler. Nice. Matt, the fried turkey once again was uh, this. I say this every year, and I know, I'm not lying. This probably was the best one you've done. Oh, well, that's awesome. It keeps it's getting better know. every year. Not really? He's like Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. you perfect your sciences. Yeah. And Greg Popovich and Tim Duncan every year just keeps getting better yeah. and better. So, uh, yeah, you guys had like – 
four fryers going out at the out at the Butler yeah. residence. I bet that yeah. smelled so damn Ooh, good. I bet it did. They both. Travis oh walked up God. and Jeff did. Y'all missed each other within ten minutes oh, of each other. Oh, I to bet come that smelled un freaking believable. If you ever smell the they frying were picking, turkey, they were again. picking off a turkey, Ryan. Yes. Oh my God. We were just eating a whole turkey right there, and then I can't even everybody imagine. come kicking. We had three. Mm. We had a chaos that morning. We showed up mm. first time ever propane tank. Lights on fire because you go in. It's an odd way to test. I don't know. There's probably a better way to test propane tanks. And once we saw it light on fire, we're like, that's probably not a good test. But you're supposed to go put the lighter up by the front before you screw it on just to make sure it's not leaking. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. You don't and want then any what happens when the propane thing goes on fire whenever it is leaking? <laughs> so that's what happens. I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> exactly. That's all so I don't want to know. My dad just jumps his bare hand on top of it and smothers oh. it to put it out because it's all inside. What? So then we're like, what the hell? Was this the hose? So we code a diagnose if it's a hose or if it's a tank. We screw on new different hose. Damn thing lights on fire again. So then we're like, oh, it has to be something's weird. Maybe what? about that hose. So we go to get a different hose. Finally realized that tank that we got from wherever was no good. So, yeah, be careful whenever you're testing. But always test because otherwise it would have been a ticking t- time bomb. And, like, when my dad lights a cigarette, boom, we would all exploded. So, yeah, we're good. Man, Good safety that check. That was crazy. Uncle's safety check. Uncle Gary safety check. Sounds like you needed the help of Hank Hill, someone who understands propane and propane. Man. We were needing to find a Hank Hill after this because <laughs> we were like, you up. can't go return this to Walmart and it'd be some dually from King of the Hill taking it and just leaving it in the corner. So we're like, we need to find a Hank Hill. Where is a Hank Hill in Austin that we can give a bad propane tank to? Because you don't want this explosive thing leaking flu- you know, fuel wherever. Yeah, you can't do so, that. Yeah, Not so, to disparage any Walmart employees wow. out there. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but show. that's where we got it from. So we, uh, they, when they sell it to you that way, you don't want to return it that See, way. See, so, it's yeah. like, you know, you got to know what the hell you're doing when you're frying turkeys. It may cost you your life if you <laughs> just out there BSing. But it tastes so damn good. It tastes, so, it tastes that good. <laughs> That's how much we love food. Um, I would risk my life to go yes. out there Friday. A man who knows about risking his life for good food, uh, if you've ever been to the Frenchies in Houston, the legit one, the one by U of H, you have oh, thought at times. Oh, yeah. It stays open really late. It's like yeah, 2 in the morning. You may be risking your life after 1. You might see Beyonce out there, but you might, Beyonce, need, to, yeah. you might need to get your chicken and go real yeah, quick. You may see Craig way out there. He's yes. out there late Not nights. necessarily the safest part of H-Town. <laughs> uh, but a man who knows all about H-Town and many more things because he's the renaissance man here on Longhorn Blitz. He is our lockdown corner here on the show. Lifetime. Time Longhorn, 2002 UT All-American, 2002 semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award, fourth-round draft choice of the New York Giants back in 2003, spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and a year with the Hamilton Tiger Cats in the CFL. When he was done with football, got himself back to Austin, Texas, and the 40 Acres, where he earned his degree. If he had a team ring, he would wear it proudly, but nonetheless, he is a card-carrying member <laughs> of DBU as he looks at his empty finger. Number 21 <laughs> in your program, number one in your hearts, Mr. Rod Babers. And, Rod, thanks for the intro, brother. Oh, we got to get off the offense because I'm just going to – just get aggravated with myself. Well, actually, no. What's one thing on offense? No, we'll we got to we got to talk about it. It's real. Um, Chris Warren's decision to transfer, which is official now. That's big. Um, you know, I wasn't. I was too young to vividly like. I remember clips of him playing, but vividly remember the impact he had on the Forty Acres. Chris Warren to me is what I hear guys from that era when they talk about Butch had not, like a guy that oh, showed flashes where you're like. Holy crap, this guy wow. is legit. That's a great comparison. But we never really saw it all come together for an extended amount of time. He, he was never able to sustain it. We've got bits and pieces and glimpses of Chris Warren being great, but never over a sustained amount of time did we see really what Chris Warren could do. I agree with that. Yeah, we've seen a couple of guys like that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if Joe Bergeron is in that category, but yeah, uh, he had a flash. I, I mean, we had a flash or two. A couple of times, um, you know, other positions, I'm sure. But you're right. I love that Butch had not a uh, comparison because I didn't watch Butch had not. I'm too young. I only but heard I've heard Danny stories story. about exactly. I've heard plenty of stories from guys about Butch had not obviously having a ceiling uh, that was kind of a next yeah. level ceiling. But there were only flashes of it, and the circumstances didn't work out. I mean, th- there are plenty of college football stories, NFL stories about guys just being the wrong fit for different teams at the wrong times Mm -hmm. and things not working out. So, I mean, it may be one of those stories with – I will be very interested to see where Chris Warren goes because he's got to find in a spread era, all right, of running backs, he does need to find somebody who likes to run downhill. I wonder Mm -hmm. wonder if he – because remember, he picked Texas over Washington 
I wonder if he doesn't just go to UW, sit out a year, and then yeah, plays one more year. He's got to he's got to find somebody that wants to run downhill with him too. You know what it, I mean? Here's here's something interesting about Chris Warren. I did a radio show a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the franchise in Oklahoma City, uh, Kobe Daniels and Sam Mays. Those guys do a great job up there. And Sam, you know, he was an All, he was an all American lineman at Oklahoma State. Mm-hmm. And Sam's take was, he said, you know, I, I can guarantee you, he said Chris Warren will be a much better player in the NFL than he was in college. So, oh, I yeah. think pro teams will look at that guy and they will have a role for him. They will know I want to run downhill. Yeah. And he yeah. has a body that can be used. Malcolm as, Brown. That they will know what to tool. do with him. Yeah, he like said, Malcolm yeah, Brown. So, I mean, Malcolm Brown's turned into a third down back. Yeah. You know, like when you can then grow your skills. And you Sam's know? take was kind of what your take was, Rod, in, in, in the spread era, especially in the Big 12. Sometimes offensive coordinators don't know. They outthink themselves on what to do with That's the 250 exactly right. pound Would you always say that uh, football is a simple game? Made complicated by simple men. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, dude, come on, man. He's 250 pounds. You need two yards. That old Give school, him like, the football. The Thurman, yeah. Thomas, the Thurman <laughs> Thomas play in Tecmo Super run, Bowl where you direct fall. snap it to him and he just goes. He will fall forward for those 250. And you have an H-back. Actually, you should have just, you know, the little shuffle motion what guys do. Been great if they'd had one of those where they he sh- he he starts at the H back mm-hmm. shuffle motions to the and they snap it right to him and boom he hits right there. It's you know like what a mean? little right Kelsey play underneath. Man, I w- I, w- yeah, I my thing is I think the coaches they have been overthinking this thing and I and my fear is that Tim Beck and Tom Herman they just don't have natural chemistry and that they never develop it and that Tom Herman is just a stubborn sob. And he will stick with somebody just because I said I was going to do it. You know what I mean? Like your parents right. go, oh, why did you do that? Because I said so. I mean, Tom Herman's one of those kind of guys. And so either they need to maybe, you know, t- Mac Brown was really good at, not oh, really good at this. He only had a couple opportunities to do it. Bring in an outside consultant, you know, bring in, I don't know how the coaching stuff works, but in terms of numbers, bring in somebody that, all right, if Tim Beck screws this thing up. I need got my plan B. Remember, right. that's what Greg Robinson was for Matt, for, for Matt Brown. I, you know what? I need a plan B. Bring in plan B because I think you need a plan B behind Tim Beck because even myself, and I'm all about consistency, and I don't want a lot more turnover. We've had a ton of turnover in the 40 acres. There's going to be more of it with all these guys leaving or either via transfers or via you know NFL opportunities. But, man, you need to have a plan B behind Tim Beck, man. You get stuck with Tim Beck for another year. With offensive line inconsistency and still no dynamic presence in the backfield and quarterback issues and man, you might do you you may have you Get may yourself. put your you may paint yourself in a corner. A couple things I want to hit on there, Rod. When we talk about Sounds the similar. the continuity factor, Tom Herman can't concern himself with what happened under Mac Brown and Charlie Strong. Can't I know it that. doesn't. It's not a good look for us who have observed the program through this whole time. But that shouldn't be Tom Herman's concern. Tom Herman's concern should be, I need to make sure I've got the guys in here that can carry out this plan, this plan that I believe will win Texas football games that will be successful. If that means jettisoning Tim Beck after one year, so be it. I don't think anybody's going to criticize him if if he gets rid of Tim Beck or tells Tim Beck to move on and brings in somebody else. I don't think that's going to be the case. I would rather him make those moves if he feels those moves are necessary than just sticking with something solely for the sake of continuity, just for not rocking the boat. I don't think that's a good reason Admit to do you made a mistake. No, but I think that's what he's doing also with the person like w- with Warren leaving. You know, instead of Warren being a guy that was a running back that everybody thought was the best running back on the staff, he didn't think it fit. Now, it might not be popular. It might not even be the right decision. But personnel-wise, he's at least shown now who knows if it's choice of his or if it's the choice of the player not agreeing with him, the personality, so many levels of that. But – Maybe he just is more prone to do it with the players right now because the pieces fit or not, and that may mean that he is able to do that with the coaches right. or not. Well, I, I, I don't disagree with you, Matt. I just think the the players and the coaches the, it's, it's two separate discussions True. because you can only but at least what he's what you were saying. It looks like he's doing that with players, so that's well, good. Well, you can you can only you can only control so much. If a guy is unhappy. And, and it's dead set on leaving. Like that's what I heard about Chris Warren. Chris Warren was miserable. Is what it I was heard. obvious. Miserable yeah. was the this word. This confirms what we are. Right. Everybody already exactly. Knew. And mm-hmm. this wasn't a secret yeah. to anybody that's been paying attention. If a guy is that unhappy, just let him go. Well, I'm saying, like, but on the way to get that unhappy, he had to make the unpopular decision of getting, you know, benching. Chris Warren, which made him become unhappy. So I'm saying those type of decisions, he may not be just doing things for continuity's sake all, all the time. 
Okay. You I, know what I'm saying? With the continuity, just talking when you're talking about the continuity with Beck, it, it's at least he's been with personnel, been able to abandon himself from any type of continuity, and it's yeah. now it just comes down to players. I, I guess I guess I see what you're saying, but uh, yeah, I, I guess I see what you're saying. Yeah, um, no, I understand. But it's uh, it's it's one of those things where if you know I, the continuity thing, I totally understand. Like I'm on board with the continuity thing. Mm-hmm. I really am. Like I'm, I feel them that hey, they've had and Tom Herman. He's so political. He picks his spots right when he wants to reflect back and harken back to the mm-hmm. other coaches and the other regimes. So I've right. never watched film. I don't want. I don't, I don't worry. I don't know those players. I, I don't know those guys that I got. I inherited and I I I evaluate them from when I got here and our practices and the way we're trying to this build team our was culture. Sixteen and twenty one the last three exactly. Years. And then when you ask him about you know. Uh, the coaching and the continuity. He's like, whoa, uh, Nation News had 33 assistant coaches in the last, uh, since he's been here in the last four years. Uh, what do you think about that? You don't want to think Not about you don't, you don't want that to be the case moving forward. And it's like, okay, so you're picking and choosing when you want to look back. Right. When, you, when it when it suits <laughs> you, when it's convenient, convenient for one. you. One is whenever he's right, and then the other one is blame somebody yeah, else. So, so, like this one, yeah. it, the blame will be on him this if one. he has to get rid of Black Beck. It isn't necessarily that. With you know, if it's just another player, just another player, it's yeah. not him admitting he's wrong. This may be the first time he would have to admit he's wrong by making a change here with Beck, but different than with the players. Yes, yeah. that's, that's true. You had not have to do that. Yet. Let's address something else, and we've kind of haven't skirted around it. We've hit it directly a few times. Rod, if you could consult with Tom Herman, and I don't believe Tom Herman's going to call Rod B. And that's not. Say, he's Rod not going to call me your, at all. Give me your opinion. Would you tell him to maybe change his approach with how he deals with how he the the vibe he gives off in front of the media? And the reason why I say that or or just in general, because and I don't know if it's the six and six record. I would imagine if Texas was eight and four, it wouldn't be a big everything deal. Would be but different. it's six and six, so everything's under the microscope. Yeah. I've heard more comments and not backlash because the Greg Schiano Tennessee thing has given a whole new meaning to the <laughs> word backlash. Sure. The craziest thing ever. I've heard more comments about Texas fans. They feel Tom Herman is arrogant. The vibe he gives off is an arrogant vibe. And I don't know if he needs to change that or if that's something that's just, it's not that big a deal, but it's magnifying because of the losing record. But there's a growing percentage of this Texas fan base that views Tom Herman as not being a likable guy. Um, Best I, coaches aren't. Yeah, I agree with that, and that's exactly right. I was going to say, mm-hmm. I mean, the, the greatest Saban, the greatest uh, all-time coaches are not likable guys, whether it be Parcells or Belichick or whether it be Saban. Dabo Sweeney is kind of the new age, and Pete Carroll, they're the new age guys. You know what I mean? Dabo like Sweeney is like the modern, the, the Mac yeah, Brown. Of those, the Mac, exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mac, I will say that Mac was one of those guys, too. It depends on how you coach. I mean, Nick Saban is so hands-on, apparently, that he's still out there correcting guys, like, legitimately about their technique and their back pedal and their their hand placement and things like that. Mac Brown never brought me up to a dry erase board and talked X's and O's with me. That's not the type of coach that he was. Right. All right, he hired Coach Akina for that. But he was a CEO, and he oversaw everything. He knew how to coach coaches rather than coach players. But everybody runs it differently. Davo Sweeney has kind of this mix of, of both the old school and the new school. So I think, yeah, it, these days you got to find that healthy mix. And from what I hear about Tom Herman, he's really into the details. He's more about kind of the Nick Saban way of doing things and making sure that he is hands-on, letting guys know, like, hey, I, I you got to, you know, dip your shoulder here and make sure you, you know, uh, keep your your center of gravity and that kind of thing. Like he's talking to guys during practice and correcting them. Mac Brown never did that. Mac Brown would watch from a distance with a booster hanging out, kicking it on, writing with his little notepad about Rod B and what he was doing, and the uh, if everybody somebody's loafing or something like that, and then he would come over and restart practice or something. Every now and then he'd just go eh. right in that notepad. Why is Rod? Great job. Why is Rod wearing nine wristbands? Yeah, whatever not, it is, not a you know what I mean. Or I don't know. I would Jackie love. Tree I think home. Mac should should actually publish his notepads because Longhorn fans are so familiar with him writing on a notepad, and I know he's probably still got them. Dude, publish those. Just publish your notepads. That would be awesome. I would love your I notes. Wanna I just want to know like exactly what it in two thousand five <laughs> national title game notes. You know what I mean? Like, but like, it, or if it was yeah, just you know Jackie I mean? like, Tree what the hell is he right? Ben Jones gonna win this thing. I ain't got nothing to worry about. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what he's right, but yeah. But my point is, everybody manages and everybody coaches differently so 
Tom Herman, what we have to realize is he's still a young coach. This is only his third year as a head coach. He still may not really know what his coaching yep. style is. We don't. We we got on Charlie Strong for learning on the job, right? We didn't like that. Right. Hey, hey, you learning on the job. And Charlie Strong had more coaching experience, head coaching experience than Tom Herman. But let's be honest, Tom Herman is learning on the job, right. folks. Yeah. yeah, he is learning on the job. We don't want to admit that, but that's what he's doing. And he's learning on the job on the on the Texas is dying. And that's we the way knew it's that. Going. Well, and we kind of knew that it was just we, that we didn't want to miss out if he was yes, saving. We saw exactly. We <laughs> saw Urban Meyer, Nick Saban, risk. and him, and said, "All right, he's our guy. Let's do it." Like Nebraska's going to see in Scott Frost. Like, mm-hmm. all right, he's our guy, man. If he comes in with some wacky, crazy concepts, that's why we suck now because we don't see the world that he sees. We need to, right now, Texas football is viewing the world through Tom Herman's eyes. And a lot of Longhorn fans are like, I don't like the way this is going. <laughs> but that's why you hired the guy. You hired the guy because he's thinking outside the box. He's not thinking like us. We're in the bubble. So in the bubble, we're seeing things a different way. Now, we still be, we're still able to question his methodology Absolutely. and his ideology. And I've questioned a ton of it because it ain't guaranteed to work. Tom Herman could be full of it. It could be he could be a used car salesman, man, and sold everybody a bill of goods. Yeah. This could all be snake oil, lies. man. Yeah, this could what? all be BS. I, we, have no yeah. idea. we we went all in because Charlie was kind of a proven commodity, and Charlie didn't work out. And Charlie is proven that he was a proven commodity. Yeah. Like, hey, I he can is, coach. Damn it, I'm not some idiot. I'm not some imbecile. You brought in here as some experiment. I can coach. I've proven it at Louisville. I'm proving it again at South Florida. I, this is what I do. I don't do nothing else. I don't this is what programs. I do. Yeah, you know what I mean? This is what I do. I'm a coach. Go ask everybody. Go ask her. My, go ask the best. They'll tell you, Charlie Strong know how to coach. That boy, he know how to coach football. That's what he does. You know what I mean? Who are so, we playing this week? Exactly. So, exactly. Tom <laughs> Herman is coming in, and I, I I know he knows football, but does he know how to be a head coach? Does he know how to it be really a, hasn't an proven effective it. one right he, now? You know, Red stuff? McCombs famously said that Charlie Strong was a coordinator and not a head coach. A lot of people disagree with him. A lot of people put racial undertones under that statement. But for Tom Herman, I think it does apply. And we don't want to say that, um, but he's 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 ten and ten in his last twenty games. I'm at the point right <laughs> now. I, I'm at the point so though. It's cool to ask the question. Yeah. I'm at the point though in the big picture. I gave Charlie the first year to figure it out. Yeah, exactly. And I'll give Tom Herman the first year to figure it out. When I kind of got off the Charlie train and really started questioning it was year two, like retaining Sean Watson and just hey, Tim Best things, coming back. things that through that through that off season, you're like, man, I, I don't know, man. I'm seeing this, this, and this, and I don't know. And then when it went sideways in 2015, specifically, not so much the Notre Dame game, which basically, to me, that just reaffirmed everything that I assumed mm-hmm. about Sean Watson as a play caller. It was that Iowa State loss, man. That's 24 nothing in Ames on Halloween, Matt, which you and I were yeah. both up there for. That was the one where I'm like, man – I don't think this is going to work. No, oh, and man. you could see it on Charlie Strong's face in there. Poor Lord, on the tarmac walking out after that. I had never seen a team so defeated. I would never seen a team have to endure that. Just the only road trip I ever go on is that one and see that team. That I felt so. And then they almost like die in turbulence on yeah. the way back. Some of the scariest moments of their lives, I believe Tim Cole which, said. I forgot about that. Which <laughs> takes yeah. us. Literally, it was like yeah, couldn't right. have it been was. more symbolic yeah, yeah. of what? The tenure of situation. Right, I just wanted to tee that up because, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm of the opinion that, I mean, I don't agree with everything Tom Herman does or no. says or how he runs his program, but that's his prerogative. He can run it the way he wants. My opinion is, as far as the opinions of everybody and is this guy running it the right way or the wrong way and you see the attrition numbers, what they could be and uh, what they might be and whatever, um, my opinion is if you want to you wanna be a red ass like a Nick Saban or a Bill Belichick, to me uh, – if you're winning games, nobody really cares. Uh, once you start, or stop. Once you stop winning games, then you know with Mac, instead of being cool and being the players' coach, uh, it, it, you're you're having a soft, entitled culture. Uh, when when you're you know doing the when you're taking the Tom Herman approach, that Nick Saban, Bill Belichick approach, it's like, well, you're having guys, you know, why are you having them do stupid stuff like eat burnt toast after right. winning things and doing all this stuff <laughs> and watching their uh, urine, you know, uh, color pee and charts stuff, and. Yeah. You know, having guys, you know, make guys, punish guys for leaving a Gatorade bottle in the locker room, and you're 6-6. Six and six. Why are you doing all this silly junior high crap? It, it cuts both ways is what I'm saying. So I think everybody from that standpoint, uh, like Rod said, I'm, I'm with you. You can question it, absolutely. But I think I would just take a step back and exactly. say. That's why you had it. Just I'll give Tom Herman the benefit of the doubt to take in everything from this year 
and adjust accordingly going into year two, which we'll talk about it here in a minute. The roster for year two is shaping up to be one where they're going to have some challenges. Mm -hmm. But, Matt, you talked about near-death experience, and not to say that Friday night was a near-death experience for anybody, but it just the, 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 the body language from the players that night was almost a state of shock. It's kind of how it was after the Maryland game, and that's how it was after the Texas Tech game. Guys just seemed like this was Tom a team. Tom was in shock. Yeah, it seemed like this was a team in shock by what had just happened. And, Rod, you go through this game, and we talk about the offense. He off- said he had no answers. We talk about the offensive issues. Yeah, that's another t- topic. Right? Another Maybe day. he's like, I got no answers. <laughs> um, like, um, you look at the offensive performance in this game, and really it comes down to two things for me, third downs and red zone. Had you just been more efficient in those two areas, you win the ball game. And we talked about that you've got eight different chances from inside the four-yard line to score touchdowns, and you don't. And then let's talk about the play call, man. The the last the last play Texas had with the lead is third and two. You call a rollout for Sam Ellinger. He throws the ball across his body. It's an interception. Texas Tech takes it the other way, sets up a touchdown. Rod, this this goes back to what we were talking about with the uh, the inability of this staff to show patience with the run game. And like Matt was saying, Matt laid it out perfectly. It's not like you're facing the eighty five Bears, man. This is Texas Tech. Texas Tech. If you if you just keep chipping away, at some point you're gonna find kind of the the leak in the boat, so to say, and then just be able to plow through that thing and sink the ship. Uh, they didn't do that, but still they had a third and two. Let me see, let me pull up my. Uh, my play-by-play here. That was a third and two mm-hmm. at the Texas Tech 37 uh, with a, inside of three minutes. If you run the ball right there and get those two, even let's say let's say they don't get it on third down. At least you run the ball. Let's say you run the ball, you get a yard. So it's fourth and one with, I don't know, 220 left on the clock, whatever yep. it was. At least you make Texas Tech burn their last time out. Yep, you run the clock. Then you've got a litany of options. And then you can go we could, for it. We could pooch like punt it. We could go it, for it. Whatever. We could try to draw them off It's the best punt in the country, by the way. Yeah, because I think Texas still had a timeout at that point. Yeah. You, the, the the door is wide open to anything you want to do right there. But I don't bl- – it, it, peop- I've seen a lot of people blame Sam Ellinger for, for this deal. And, and Sam – Sam does have an issue late in games turning the ball over. At this point, you do something doing hey, against man. Texas Tech, against Oklahoma. No a, with a true freshman quarterback, that's going to be the case. That right? was at prom last semester. <laughs> and uh, you see back. how he plays <laughs> balls to the wall. And he's got that gun. <laughs> and I told you guys this. Well, I've been watching him in high school. He's, Sam's got that gunslinger in him. And, man, it's just no different than the, the Favres and the Roethlisbergers and the other guys we see in that mold. At some point, they're going to say, oh, I can make that play. No, man, you can't. You just got to live to fight another day. It's He's also fair. the leading rusher At least all in, of yar- in yards and attempts. So he does believe that, and, and rightfully so, that he needs to do everything. Right. Yep. I don't, so I don't blame him for the failed third down and the loss. I blame the coaches that put the ball in his hands again when you've done that three or four times already and it's backfired on you. Just run the ball at least once. At least make them burn a timeout, and then you've got fourth and one, and you can do whatever you want from it. And that. like we said, they don't know their personnel, right? That's why the wide receiver rotation is so inconsistent, the running back issues. Uh, they don't know their personnel. So in that third and two, they put Sam in a position where Longhorn fans are like, whoa, why would you put a freshman quarterback who's already proven in late game situations mm-hmm. that you know he he has a little he's a little anxious with the football exactly and um and he may not he's a little careless with the football and he may not take care of it why would you even put him in that position so once again I'm getting back to I'm not criticizing your play calling because that's creativity I'm not gonna go there I don't know if I'd be that much better but your 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 decisions some of your common sense decisions your football why philosophy. not run the you got a you got a top ten offensive lineman your first offensive Lyman's is going to be drafted since 2008. Maybe if you studied history of Texas football, you'd do it a little bit better. Why not run behind him? Why not say, you know what? Screw it. It's third and two. That, I don't know, if it's, if it's, a, why, if it's, if it's a quarterback, if it's a quarterback off tackle play, whatever. You know what? This is that guy. I'm going to tell him, hey, man, we're coming off you, big boy. And after that, we'll let the chips fall where they may. You know what I mean? Like, why yeah. not depend on your best player? Sam is your best uh, quarterback. You know, Connor Williams is your best offense tackle. So, you know what? We're going that side. You know what I mean? We'll figure out a way. We're going to put Kendall Moore over there, too, and we're going right off tackle, brother. We, all we need is two yards. Y'all give it to us. Like, why not do that? Or, you know what I mean? Like, I don't I don't understand. Yeah. So, that's kind of my issue with the offensive play calling. And, you know, and my thing is they don't know their team either. 
in the wins Texas had this year, they they run the ball on average, rushes per game, 44.6 times in the wins this year, in the six wins. In the losses, 32.8 times. It's like, dude, and I, and I, people are like, well, that's only, what, eight rushes? Give it, it's not that, you know what I mean? It's not that much. Eight, eight, you know, it's not that much. Eight to 12 rushes, whatever it is, on a, on a game-to-game basis. But think about, that's one of them, though. That's one of the opportunities you were supposed to run it. And think about how big of a, uh, a change in game that was, like in mm-hmm. momentum and and the entire like shift of the dynamic of the game is because on a third and two where most teams would run the football because it just makes sense uh, statistically and with the odds, you decided to throw it. And it's not like you have Baker Mayfield back there or Sam Darnold. You know what I mean? Like, I, I love Sam Elliott, but he's not there yet. I think right. we all agree at one point we hope and he has that kind of ceiling, but he ain't there yet. And you put him in that kind of position and you played yourself. I mean, that's you. I mean, that's and that goes to coaching. You lost this game. Coaching yeah. staff lost this game. And just like the Maryland game, you got out coached by Cliff Kingsbury and his crew. You got to own that. Yeah. Cliff Kingsbury came in here and out coached you. All right, in Austin, he did. And he used two quarterbacks, just like you used two quarterbacks. And ain't a lot of excuses you can have. You got out coached. You the guys played well enough for Texas to win. And they the defense dropped a lot of interceptions they should have caught, and there were opportunities there. But offensively, you not only abandoned the run, you took it out in the backyard, shot it dead, and buried it. Well, and Just I, like you did versus Maryland. What's interesting about this, how you talked about the self-scouting issue that we've been able to see just over time, because when you look at football ideologies and then what you actually implement on the field when they contrast, it's confusing. And knowing that staff knows numbers, you would think they would know that in all of Texas's running aspects of, or aspects of the running game, from success rate to explosivity to line yards to opportunity rate to power success rate, those things not good for Texas. The one thing that is good for Texas is the stuff rate. They actually are above average, less than 19%, which is the natural average, a full percentage below it. So if there's anything that isn't ranked, you know, around 80 to 100 yeah. in all of Texas's run game, is short yardage running. You don't get stuffed at the line of scrimmage, which is a gain of zero or negative yards. Texas is above average at that. Everything else below average, yet in that situation. And then with the idea that you always win when you run it 40 times and that tech doesn't do well, and you have this mentality of physicality, once you add up all of these things and then Sam decision, also starting. it isn't around. necessarily that you're talking about criticizing a play call. It's like, okay, why are these things not aligning with what you say you want to do to be successful and what actually you have been able to do to be successful. And that's what's dumbfounding. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll criticize the play call. I thought it was dumb. I thought it was just lack. It just lacked total common sense. That's what there I said. Go. The offense lacks we common can all sense. Totally be on the they're, same they're page all, too. Like I said, they're so smart sometimes. They're just, they're stupid. And I, and that's my thing about them, like the coaching staff. I just wonder, they don't realize what kind of offense they were. And I, some of the play calls I'm starting to like, like they, they're using the screen game more, mm-hmm. using the short passing game more. Uh, I see them taking the deep shots. Um, but, yeah, they in, inside the five-yard line, those eight plays they had, um, they were dumbfounding. Even the, the wide receiver throwback pass, which essentially was the same play that Sam Ellinger, they connected on with well, Sam Ellinger like evol- as the start of the, of the play. Yeah, the start, uh, start of the game. Uh, where they connected, and it was a great play. Actually, I like that play. It was a good play call. Let's you know they actually started to script plays and learn who they were. By the way, no scripted plays. They never ran the ball once. If you talk about the first 15 of those plays, I think in the first 30 plays, they they ran the ball nine times. In the first 20 plays, they ran it like three or four times. So in the scripted plays they have, the 15 or 20 plays, they know, or they used to have no faith at all in the running game, and then they did not run it at all. Early on, and I remember like Quandre Diggs and uh, a lot of guys on Twitter were like, mm-hmm. "Man, why don't they run the damn ball? You running the ball in the first quarter pays dividends in the fourth quarter. It's hard to, you know, what I mean to 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 quantify it, but it does, especially against Texas Tech. And Texas didn't do it enough. They just didn't run the ball yeah. enough. And I think that's why the forty times or more stat plays a role. You're undefeated, five and zero. You only won six freaking games. You ain't that good. So something is with you running, deciding to run the football with a great punter, also with a great defense. All you gotta do on offense is not screw it up. Your defense can win games. Your punter can win games. You wasted the best field goal kicking game of the year. <laughs> think about that. So your punter 
best punter in the country. Your field goal kicker, best game of the season for your field goal kicker. Your defense, of course, playing lights out. They play great defense. Yeah, they drop some picks, and but they played good enough for you to win. You played so bad offensively that you dragged the other two phases of the game down who had some of their best games of the season. Think about that. That's how bad you were oh. offensively, Tom Herman. And Tim Beck. And if we all were on the running game, just one thing I want to point out that might be helpful for next year, though. You look at, say, highlight yards per opportunity, which is yards that running back gets past the line of scrimmage, sort of shows explosivity of running backs. This year, now in about 50, 60 carries instead of Deontay Foreman's 300 that he had last year. Yeah. But both Tony Carter and Daniel Young had higher highlight yards per opportunity than Deontay did the last season. So in a small sample, very yeah. good to show that like in space, they are making guys miss as well or better than Deontay did. That and year. they uh, and they took and the coaching staff took too long to find that out too. That's something else on the coaching staff. All right, uh, there you go. I'm unprecedented, guys. I gotta take a bathroom break real quick. Cool, cool. Is that cool? I'll Do be it. back in like a minute. I promise. Yeah. I'll time it. All right. All right. Um, I wanted to talk about the defense against Texas Tech, but I don't know what else needs to be said. I mean, I feel like in the losses this year, it's a broken record. Couldn't ask any more of them, and they held on as long as they could, and then eventually the dam broke, which in this league, even against the bad offenses like the Kansases of the world, it's going to happen. But, Rod, the, the trend, we talked about this a little bit last week, but I think it's worth getting into now, now that we've got a better idea of what the NFL outlook looks like, now that you know we know Connor Williams is gone. Uh, uh, we, we know kind of we've got an idea of, of what's going to happen. And, and at this point – you know, I, I don't know when people are going to listen to this podcast between the time it goes live and our next recording, but I would plan on, if you're a Texas fan, I would plan on not seeing any of Holton Hill, Deshaun Elliott, or Chris Boyd next year in the secondary. Just plan, on, plan on all three being gone. Don't plan on seeing Malik Jefferson next year. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Likely don't plan on seeing Charles Amenahu next year. I think there's a really good chance all those guys could be gone. Um, the, the secondary guys, Deshaun Elliott and Holton Hill, like we know, Holton Hill's not coming back. Yeah, at this point, I think Holton Hill. We're just waiting on the official announcement. Uh, Deshaun Elliott would just be a smart decision, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. That's just me personally. I think people are like, oh, he's going to be drafted in the second round. Okay, what's yeah, a shame? <laughs> I don't know if there's a shame in getting drafted in the second round. I was like, okay, drafted in the second round. You don't think he's going to make an NFL roster? Well, and that just shows you know where I mean? the ideologies of people are like, no, you aren't going to get your super millions. This other guy's like, man, I'm about to get my lifelong dream yeah. to get paid oh, six sorry. figures I'll to get, go do I'll, I'll only, yes. I'll I think get, anybody in the world yeah. would do that if you related it yeah. to yourself. I'll get paid only a little under a million a year. Sorry. Right. That, that also will yeah. suck. And doing My what eight, I love. 850000 Instead of for free for this asshole. What Texas like. fans need to realize is this. And I'm probably going to hurt some feelings here, but some Texas fans need to hear this. This isn't 1998 where Ricky Williams is making an NFL decision. This isn't. Nope. And that this, was bizarre, too. This isn't 2002 where Roy Williams is making a decision. Mm-mm. Like, this is a different time. And Every the time. thing that has changed the game more than anything else is the NFL rookie wage scale. When, when NFL it's rookie science. salaries got scaled back, the NFL now is more like the NBA where – you're really all you're doing is you're focused on getting that second contract. The second yep. contract is where you're going to make the big money. Yep. Unless you're at the tippy top of the first round, unless you're top top fifteen. Yeah, mm-hmm. thank top you. Top fifteen Rod. guys. Really. Well, unless you're one of those guys, top fifteen guys. You're you're going for that second contract. And the other thing is, Matt, you just kind of hit on it a little bit. Guys are smarter now. They're realizing, man. I don't have a long time to play this game, so Technology I'm going to go ahead. So if, if I'm Deshaun Elliott or Charles Amenahu and I've got a chance to get in the door and better myself and develop, why not spend a year developing where I can get paid to do it? And then yeah. if you're good, you get that what you were saying, that second paycheck a year earlier, and then you get that, and you can always go back and get that year of earning power back on the back end. You can never get it back on the front end, especially when you're in the most physical sport where we've now learned that certain positions, Deshaun Elliott, his head could run into a wall one play, boom, you, who knows what happens. We saw Deontay Foreman last year. Who knows what that Achilles ticking time bomb was, if that was something exactly. triggered, if that would have came. Where yeah. would his life be now? So, yeah, you got to go if you're going to get drafted. If you want to now some players there are players in certain situations that are different and they may actually have reason and incentive to stay but it's good to see that the old norm it's i would like to at least see like 
the public be on the side of the public because rarely do you side with management except for in these weird like college situations where you don't side with the people like you and you want them to stay for this workforce which is only going to actually possibly hurt them if they're that good at it. Like take take Ricky Williams' decision back when he made it in the, in the winter in 97. Rod, you know, at the time, and Ricky was thought to maybe be, if I remember right, I could First be wrong. First overall. If he had come out as a junior, I think the projections were like maybe middle of the first round, maybe getting into that top ten. Mm-hmm. But if he were to come back, you could almost guarantee he would have been a top five pick. And your thought first overall. And Rod, you're talking about the money from at that time going from the middle of the first round to the top five in the draft. Yeah. You're talking maybe tens of millions of dollars. Yes. Yeah, that time. In terms of difference. With no rookie wage. Even scale. up to Bradford's so, time. Bradford was the highest paid guy. He got seventy two million yeah. out of so the ga- So the gamble at that time to come back and wait is worth the, even Roy even Roy Williams. And Roy Williams probably was drafted mm-hmm. his senior year, probably where he would have been drafted had he come out as a junior. You could argue had he come out a year earlier, maybe he would have been drafted a spot or two higher. But Possible. the money Possible. for the top end of the first round at that time was just so big yeah. that it was almost like, how can I maximize my value to get yeah, one of those high contracts? as I can. Now, you already know where you're slotted. You literally have a slot. Like, oh, they're saying you're going to be the – the 31st pick, we know what you're going to make. We know exactly what you're going to yeah. make and uh, your signing bonus and everything. everything. The only the only guys that top the first round are setting the precedent, and it's a trickle-down factor in terms of who's how the value of every pick is. Now it's about the pick. And you, everything that's changed that. is all of the things have fallen in the favor of leaving early because then with the information yeah. and then with the contracts. Which is why they've set records for the last three years, actually, for the amount of juniors that are declared for the NFL draft. Because mm-hmm. agents, and uh, oh, I know they're not supposed to talk to agents, but agents are telling these guys, hey, they're explaining the issue with the uncle or the dad or the mom. And Connor Williams, I'm glad his people were smart enough to understand, like, hey, you got to get the hell out of here. Yeah, and there's not a Texas fan out there who should fault Connor Williams for skipping no, the bowl game. Nobody is. I mean, he, yeah. he, he this team probably isn't bowl eligible if he doesn't come back and play those last two games. That's a yeah. great point. Might yeah. not be. Uh, well, yeah, they might not be. You, you can make the that. argument. No, I yeah, can because sure. I don't know if they beat West Virginia without the Connor The point exactly. is, Connor Williams did what he was supposed to do. He came back, helped his team get to a bowl game. Nobody can, can argue with stuck. nobody can argue with the career he's had. Yeah, he's going to be a top ten. He's the first Texas offensive lineman drafted since two thousand eight. So at least he ends that drought. That is progress, at least mm-hmm. for the program on a macro scale. And when you look at just his decision to come back and play at the time, we sort of were like, well, it could be a little risky because you came early. But then how much he helped himself by performing so really well did. from that that yeah. then it only makes sense to definitely don't risk anything when you've already put great tape and great health and you are just one bowl game away from being drafted. Yes, Amanda, you're right. Everything's different, but, I mean, Mac Brown was really good at it. He couldn't keep Vince Young here, and then Vince Young kind of opened up the the dam yeah. uh, in terms of guys leaving early. But his best recruiting job ever was not Chris Sims. It wasn't Vince Young. It wasn't Cole McCoy. Mm. It was Ricky Williams. Yep. Yep. The So when you look at the roster, though, Rod, and we'll talk about the bowl game because as of right now we still don't know who the bowl yeah, opponent's going to be. We won't find that out until Sunday, and we'll talk about start talking about the bowl game next week and get to some season recap type stuff. But when you start looking at this roster and the attrition, it's really two different stories on two different sides of the ball. Defensively, yep. it's all about NFL draft affections. Like I said, losing three guys in the secondary, Malik Jefferson, he's Malik's – gone i think we can all admit that and that's not a shock to anybody and then maybe charles amenahu most i think i think it's very probable at this point charles amenahu goes really so, i think so interesting i, I think so because for the, for the, the reason i mentioned that surprised me for but re- i mean if he's gonna be i didn't even th- realize he was that highly consistent on draft boards but if he is and he wants to go uh, from what i've been hearing uh, people see his frame and his body and think holy crap and like what i said saying third or fourth or if you're somewhere around somewhere there around maybe there. fifth sixth but if you're gonna Still. get if you're gonna go if you're gonna be a developmental guy be a developmental guy and get in a paycheck. Yes. Yeah, be in the pra- on practice, somebody's practice. Form. Exactly. Yeah. So I think you look at losing those five guys on defense all to the NFL. Uh, we talked last week, Rod, and I'm writing this on the site today. I think one of the main goals during bowl prep for Todd Orlando should be, hey, run your 2018 defense on the field out there for most of these bowl practices. I would do it, period. I wouldn't, honestly, the other guys, like, mm-hmm. I would, it, this is what Todd Orlando needs to do. And I don't know if we talked about it on the show. He needs to have a man to man with those guys. Like man to man, like we're done. Talking like about the guys that are leaving. I'm talking about the guys that are leaving. Okay. Man to man with Malik, you know, man to man with Houghton Hill, man to man with Deshaun. 
Who was the other guy in the secondary? Chris Boyd, the men who. Uh, Chris Boyd, the men who. Man to man conversation. Listen, I got a family. Y'all one day gonna have a family. You got people you gotta take care of. I understand that. Glad y'all had a nice, a great year. Um, with, under you know, with my my tutelage and my defense. You know, all right. So let's help each other. I need to know if you're leaving. I need to know. All right. I just need to know right now. If you're leaving, and if you change your mind or you're on the fence, I need to know that too. All right. And I'll tell you if I'm whatever I'm doing. I just want to know where you stand. He needs to know where these guys stand because I'm with you. I think regardless, you go into it, uh, the bowl game, airing on the side of caution where basically assume the worst that everybody's leaving. Hell, I'm Tom Herman. I assume Todd Orlando's leaving. I got a list of defensive coordinators in case this coaching carousel opens up his dream position. I don't know. I, I haven't done enough research on Todd Orlando to know where he's from and what's his dream job. But maybe his dream job randomly opens up because this coaching carousel ain't going how everybody thought it was going to go. You know what I mean? So you better be ready for that, too. But also in the bowl games, man, I would prepare for everybody leaving, all those guys on right. defense. So I'm with you. I just play the young guys and tell Tyler Orlando to play the young guys. Too. But Tyler Orlando needs to talk to those young guys and figure out who's leaving and who's not. So he avoids the what we've seen as a cycle that Vance Bedford and Manny Diaz before him, all, both of those guys, good defensive coordinators before, and that Manny Diaz even after Texas, and they fell victim to losing the entire kind of uh, heart and soul of their defense after that first year where they had one of the best defenses in the country. And honestly, Rod, if those guys are going to the NFL, maybe you hold off on how physical you are with them because they've given what they've could. Exactly. They've given what they could to the program. Maybe you hold back from being physical with those guys. I, there's no, there's no Both amount, sides. there's no amount of we Oklahoma would. drills that are going to help Malik Jefferson at this point. Dude, I you might know? said, I might said, I Malik might tell him I'm if, good without Oklahoma. If drills. If those guys tell me they're they're leaving, I'm serious. If I'm Tyler Lindo, I wouldn't even play him. Like I just put them on the sideline. I would if they tell me they're leaving, but they want to be part of the bowl game and the bowl experience. Cause a lot of those guys have never ever been right. to a bowl game. Honestly, I don't play them. I say, man, you can sit on the sideline because honestly, it's gonna help me. I need these other guys to need they they need the reps. I would okay? I would I would play them, but I wouldn't work them in until maybe like the week of when you get to the bowl site and start practicing. I wouldn't play them at all. But, but I think I'm a these player. bowl practices in Austin give the you know. Instead of Puna Ford getting reps at nose, it should be Chris Nelson and Gerald Wilbon. There are no reps. The football is different because of this. There are no reps like game reps. I agree. You can't simulate it. You can't replicate it in practice. You can do your damnness, but you cannot. You can't. And to give these young guys who are going to play next year, if these guys are leaving, and Puna Ford we know is leaving, right. all right? So Puna, honestly, I'm just trying to keep him healthy. Like, I'm like, hey, Puna, we need to keep you healthy. That's it. All right, I mean, so you do what you got to do, but I'm just making sure you, you leave here healthy. But for guys who are leaving to go to the league, who are, like, leaving early, man, I don't know if I, you know, because Puna's playing, uh, like, the senior bowl, too. So Puna, East, East Puna wants to game. grind. Puna's, like, yeah. in the grind mode. I understand That's that. That's where it's case by yeah. case. Yeah. So I understand, like, it's kind of case by case. But, man, I, I need I need these reps for my young guys. Oh, yeah, for sure. All right, so Malik and Holden and Deshaun. I mean, I'll put y'all in there, but man, well, I Holden need Hill, these Holden reps. Hill, we know, we know he's, he's going to get reps. Yeah, you're he's right. On the Sorry, anyway. you're right. Um, but yeah, I don't know why I didn't. So if I'm him, earlier, like, but... and Charles Minnow, like, man, I need these reps. All these are 15 practices and a game. Like, I need these reps so I won't be a scrub next year. So my my freaking sorry freaking, uh, my freaking uh, coaching stock does not drop precipitously. Manny Diaz is now where he was in 2011. Think about that. Mm -hmm. He lost six years to that coaching debacle, mm -hmm. to right. that, you know what I mean, to, to, to that culture on the 40 acres, which was so toxic. He lost six years of his coaching career. That guy should already be a head coach, man. But that's what happened here. And I think the same thing could happen at Todd Orlando, man. You better watch it. Uh, I'll, th I'll throw this out there too, Rod. Does, does Malik Jefferson, whenever he makes his decision, does Malik decide to skip the bowl game? Hell yeah, you do. Skip the bowl game. Does Deshaun Elliott, if his decision comes in early enough? I need all y'all. As it. we sit right now, I, I think it. with Deshaun Elliott, to me at this point, I'm serious. It, I'm just waiting on the official announcement. I'm I'm convinced he's gone. I've been told yeah. the staff is preparing like he's not coming back. Deshaun Elliott? Yeah. 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 So with Malik Jefferson and Deshaun Elliott, do they just decide – I would just skip the bowl game. That's where it's you up do, to them you know what? it can only help you work on your future yeah. and help them for their future. You're doing you know? everybody a favor if you do that. I, I think you're doing yourself a favor, number one, so you can start focusing on, this, on the next level. And I think you're doing the coaching staff a favor because they don't have to worry about trying to play you during the bowl game and split up reps during practice. Nope, nope, he's gone. 
we are already moving on. You want to start auditioning for uh, the, the the job of starting safety at Texas? Now is your time, young bucks. Let's go. Mm-hmm. I think that's the way you do it. Ever, people com- people that complain about I love the, it. people that complain about the Leonard Fournette deal at LSU last year. That's I don't insane. think Ed Orgeron cares because he said, "All right, Darius Geis is going to be our number one running back next year anyway." I, I need them reps. Right. I need them reps. And now the NCAA is limiting practices more and more every year. Hell, man, reps and practices. That's time. That's the one thing you can't get back. Hell, in any uh, facet of life, right. you can't put a price on extra time. That's what the bowl game is. So I think, yeah, you would – honestly, those guys would do Texas and Tom Herman a huge favor. They would just declare and say – Just make it a lot easier on everybody. I'm not playing the bowl game. Yeah. yeah. And then some may want to just, you know, stay in shape since it's draft-worthy. And then you even heard that – I totally can't believe it's something, but NFL teams, some higher-ups don't like players that don't – give it their all in practice so it's so much minutia involved with it but if it basically comes down to stay in shape they want to play they want to play if not it totally is only going to help the future and help your own future to rest and it should be totally understandable the conundrum you get into rod is if these guys decide they want to play the bowl game and yeah. in the scenario you Best laid out scenario, they live out what, dream. what the coaches have to what the coaches have to determine is what's more important is 2018 more important, or is winning this bowl game to get to a seventh win more important? Yeah. Because yeah. if the seventh win is more important, you play Malik Jefferson play and everybody. Sean Elliott and yeah. Chris Boyd and Charles Minnesota. But this coaching staff has not really sided on with that mentality. They've always kind of sided with the long – we're not going to sacrifice the short-term success – uh, for the long-term goals, we're not going to do it. Just, I wonder though how much that Texas Tech loss has altered those plans. On could be process. good point. Yeah, yeah you didn't you expect hear that. There are those right. deal breakers because Herman, you know, was comfortable on the long term, but then if the fire comes up behind you after you lose to Tech and you lose, and the fan base is upset, how? I mean, I honestly think, man, Charlie if you, two and a half. Years. If they were under your under your, I'm going under your scenario, Rod. Mm. If they were seven and five under that scenario, they're probably looking at us like, well, we're playing with house money anyway. Yeah. So trying to get if you guys don't want to play the bowl game, cool. Th- yeah. th- thank you for your service and wish the best of luck. Let us know if there's yeah. anything we can help you with. Okay. You're saying this is about more about job security in the I'm end. saying I'm yeah. saying I don't think Tom Herman wants a losing record on his resume for year one. He doesn't have that Very luxury. True. That's no, I agree with that. No, when, I'm not he's hired to win football going games, going so back to what we talked about that. earlier with his approach to everything, when you've talked about this was wrong before and this was wrong and this this was wrong, what if your year one to everybody from the outside looking in, looks exactly like Charlie Strong's year one. What have you really changed? Uh, you know? Not much like at all. We, when when we, we look at this program and we followed it Depth. from Tom Herman's day one to now, we can see the changes and we can see the differences in the program. But if you're just talking from a perspect, from just from a perception outside. standpoint and trying to sell something to recruits and guys recruiting against you, it'd be really easy, especially if like Jimbo Fisher gets that A&M job and says, look at what Tom Herman's doing. It's no different than the last guy. He's six and seven his first year, too. They got all these guys leaving. They're going to be that much better next year. Yeah, the conversation, I think the narrative has shifted. And this is why I said, if Tom Herman had just beaten the teams he was supposed to beat, Maryland, Texas okay. Tech, damn, there would be no conversations about this. None. It would all be optimism going forward. But because they lost those bookend games to the season, now the conversation has shifted to, his, uh, you know, competency as a head coach, all right? Just, hey, man, do you actually know what the hell you're doing? Or are you just kind of selling everybody uh, kind of a bill of goods? And number two, how can they be better next year when you're losing right. five, six, maybe seven of your top ten best players? Just like Charlie Strong. You are losing I – mean, you could lose Shane Bouchelle. You're losing Connor Williams. Chris Warren, I'm not even putting him on that list, but you're going to lose Malik Jefferson, uh, Deshaun Elliott potentially, Houghton Hill potentially. You're talking about guys like Charles Amenahu and Chris Boyd making decisions, um, Jake McMillan and Terrell Cuny potentially. I mean, those are, let me, let's, you could potentially those. lose a ton of front line guys. Remember, what's the biggest issue with this team? They didn't have a lot of depth. They let's didn't address have a those two depth. before and now we got time. Those are the two that, if I'm looking at the culture of this program, those are the two moves that concern me the most. And we, you, t- you hit on it a little bit, Rod, but for Jake McMillan, for a guy that's a two-year starter mm-hmm. that could leave Texas if he wanted to because Jake's already got his bachelor's yeah. degree, mm-hmm. could leave with a master's degree if he wanted, for him to even be publicly, be publicly out there, he's thinking, nah, you know what? 
I might give it I, up. I don't. I don't think I want this anymore. I'm, Not here. If I do, mm, it'll be somewhere else. Somewhere else. Man, that's a that's a troubling sign. It's a red flag. It's it's a red flag. And I don't. I don't. I don't. You. you it's. It would be speculation to point fingers. Is that Tom Herman? Is it Derek Wareheim? Is it Tim Beck? I don't know. I do know that that's a bad look and that's a problem. That yeah. tells me that everything on that off in the offensive side of this program, it's not all clicking on all cylinders. I'd rather either go somewhere else. You're talking about Austin, Texas. You're talking about one of the hottest and fastest growing cities in the this country. This was Jake McMillan's dream. So, so many people wanted to come here, and he's talking about – Like, Jake yeah, McMillan I, committed to Mac Brown. Yeah, like, that's like, how long I'd Jake McMillan's been involved in this program. I'd rather play for some other random team or give up football altogether, which is something you just cannot – you know, you can't ever simulate that or replicate it. I'd rather do that than play for this offense again. Like, you know what I mean? And under this regime. That says a lot. It does. So it's a lot. And I would, I would love to get inside Tom Herman's head and – just kind of wonder how he's looking at it. Is he, is he, I don't, I'm not in panic mode about this, but it does, like I said, make you question. Yeah. The, the NFL decisions to me are different than the attrition of transfers and even the transfers. We we did an attrition board at Horns 24 7. We posted it last night. And normally I don't do things like that. You guys know me. I don't speculate on transfers, but yeah. there's just so damn much out there that it, it, it's, you know, you're basically not addressing the elephant in the room. It's like, okay. Here's who we think are transfer candidates. And you start looking at that list and you say, okay, really when you start breaking this thing down, some of these guys that are attrition candidates, they're either non-contributors or, or young guys that um, could be about to get recruited over or whatever. Um, you know, a guy like Shane Bouchelle, that's different, but that's the nature of the beast with quarterbacks. But it's yeah. the guys that, like you said, that are just thinking about leaving just – for no reason other I'm than, eh, I think I'm done. I think I'm done. That's, My experience has been so bad, I think I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. That's not good. It's not no. good. Yeah, and you're going to have out. guys just leave. And that's we, burnout. Yeah, exactly. And that's more turnover within the team, too. I mean, we're talking about, and, and, and the one that worries me most, honestly, I know people are talking about Connor Williams. I, I expect us to lose Connor Williams. He's that talented. You can't keep a player that damn good, all right? Yeah. Even after he, doing, he was, when he was hurt, they were saying he's going to be a top 10 pick. I wasn't worried about losing Malik. We've been preparing for that forever, too, if Malik decides to leave. But he's gonna, I think he's going to decide to leave. And Deshaun Elliott was just a pleasant surprise. You didn't expect him to be that damn good. So he's kind of like a comet, you know what I mean? Like you didn't expect him to be that good, and he ended up being great. And so I, it's, it's kind of one of those things where it's not as hurtful um, because it's kind of an added – it's free money with Deshaun Elliott, you know what I mean? Houghton Hill also kind of in that case, too, because – now he is so disgruntled about his state of affairs, he may end up transferring or he's not going to be, be playing because he's suspended either way. But the one that hurts me that I think is going to happen inevitably is Shane Bouchelle. And I think he's going to yeah. hurt the program and set the program back because the quarterback position has been one of the biggest issues, if not be, the biggest issue, on the 40 acres since Colt McCoy left the last seven years. And you got Shane Bouchelle as your first quarterback to start an entire season since Colt McCoy last season. But now that's been disrupted because Sam Ellinger fits the system of Tom Herman a little bit more. But he's already missed games because of injury. So you got to have a sure thing behind him. Right. And they're hoping Shane can be that guy. I think Shane's going to get out of here and leave because Shane knows that he can start somewhere else. And he's right about that. I do too. Here's the deal with that, though, Rod. This is my thing on the Shane Bouchelle issue. They need to figure that out right now. Like, there needs to be no BS in the man to man conversation between Shane Bouchelle and Tom Hurd. Yeah. They need to sit down here pretty soon, this week, next week, man whatever. Man-to-man conversations. And yeah. Shane Bouchelle needs to ask Tom Herman, Coach, do I have a legitimate chance to compete for the job in the spring? No coach it? speak. Or is Sam your guy? Sam, if your Sam guy. is your guy. I got to go. That's fine. It's cool. Just tell me, and I'll go. I'll let you go. You want to get a JUCO guy, grad transfer, whatever. But if Sam is your guy, just tell me now so I can go and have a fair chance to start somewhere else. Or is it at too much disrepair right now? They, I don't think that would be doing Shane Bouchelle a disservice if you're saying, oh, yeah, you can come back when you know Sam is the guy. And let Shane Bouchelle leave now. Let him get a fresh start somewhere in the spring where he can go and sit out a year and then compete. Jeff, you know that's not how it works. Okay? I know that's not how They're it works. They're going to sell it because we all love Shane. We want Shane to do well. They're going to sell Shane at Bill of Goods. Shane may buy it. I doubt it because I think Shane's got people around him, his father and people who – played at the next level and different levels, they're going to say, hey, you need to get the hell out of here because you can go start somewhere else. Now, where he'll go, I don't know. 
I, I, you know what I mean? So I think that would be kind of the question for him. But I think he is gone because he is a starting quarterback. It's just not going to work at Texas. And then Cameron Rising, Casey Thompson, those guys, one of those guys is going to be forced to play before they need to because they'll be the backup quarterback. You know what you're, you know what you're and looking you'd rather at, rather redshirt both of those guys. Rod, please stay in your seat because what I'm about to say could cause you to blow a gasket. You know what Tom Herman's facing now? You got to move Gerard Hurd to quarterback full time. Oh, God. You have to. You have to. Yeah. You got to do it. You got to no do it. That ain't no quarterback. And you're going to do it for his senior year, too. Yeah. You have to. I will you bet, have to. But, but obviously, no, Tom right. Herman does you're not right. want to do that. So I would guess I'm, even I'm, if you have no, to, you're right. he won't do it. He's After have 12 to games, it. I'm with you because right. Gerard Hurd wasted a year playing wide receiver. Wasted year. a year playing wide receiver. Next. And I'm not, I'm not in the camp that says Gerard Hurd's an answer because I don't think he no, is. No, he's not. But as a backup quarterback, man, you could do worse. Yeah, exactly. So this year, I mean, I, and I know people wouldn't like it, but if you'd have had him actually as your backup quarterback this year, there's a chance – you could have red shirted Sam Ellinger. Like, there's a chance of it. If you would have took it seriously from the beginning, that spring practice, you're our backup, Shane's our starter, there's a chance. You finished 6-6 six and six anyway. Yeah. You finished 6-6 six and six anyway. Right. But that's the one and thing. I, and I, and I know you, you, you could have finished, what, 5-7? and seven? Were you that bad of a coach? You finished 6-6 six and six anyway. So, potentially, Sam's out. I know Sam proving himself to be the future quarterback, but you're going to lose now one of those quarterbacks. If you could have red shirted one, you could have had both of them coming back for 2018. If you could have been thinking ahead of time, and I don't think he was, and I'm not saying that he had that option because I know I had quarterbacks leave and the quarterback depth, but that's only because you chose to have Gerard Hurd play wide receiver instead of quarterback. If you'd have taken it seriously, there's a chance Sam Ellicker could have redshirted. There's a chance of it. And think Man. about where you'd be in 2018 then with two quarterbacks coming in, Kevin Rising and Casey Thompson, and a quarterback competition between a redshirt freshman when all the great quarterbacks in Texas have been redshirt freshmen, okay? That's close with the Vince Young and Cole McCoy, and then you could have been sitting pretty at the quarterback position. But now you're struggling, struggling. And you ain't even guaranteed to keep both of those quarterbacks in that 2018 class. Ain't no guarantee you're going to keep both of them. Both of them are set to be here for spring ball. I know they are. So, yeah. Here's the Hell, last I thing would I'll too say. if I looked at the quarterback position for Texas. <laughs> Here's the last thing I'll say. Matt, are we doing picks this week? Oh, uh, we can wrap it up. Oh well, let me just well, before I got picks bef- if we before want yeah, them, before we get to that, let me let me just say this before we, we wrap this up. When you talk about the attrition, and if you're Tom Herman, and I'm not saying this is the right way or the wrong way, I'm just trying to get inside Tom Herman's head and figure out what, how he's looking at this. Do you say, you know what, if all these guys want out, let them out. Let's clear the deck as much as possible. Because I not that to say that the guy the the older guys or guys that are in the program right now aren't bought in, but maybe Tom Herman just wants to do this with his guys, guys that are completely aligned with his vision. He mm-hmm. wants to win with his guys. He just wants to completely restock the cover with guys he's recruited that he's knows what he's fit. about to believe in his vision from day one, and maybe he's cool with all these guys leaving. Yeah. You know, because he knows, be, hey, yeah, this isn't sure. going to be a year two thing anyway. We're not going to, we're not, he's not going to, Tom Herman's not going to come out and say that. Yeah, he's but like, I, we, I ain't Charlie Strong. But we can look at time. this and we can look at this from afar and say, you know what? Next year, if they get to a bowl, just looking at it from afar, if they get to a bowl game next year, we'll probably say that was a pretty good year. So Tom Herman's not looking at 2018 as being the be all end all. Tom Herman's looking at 2020. By the time that first, by the time that first full cycle class he has are juniors. A 2020 season, I think that's probably when he's looking at. That's when we want to say, okay, now the expectation is we go win 10, 11 games, we're in a conference championship game, and we're in the mix for the playoff. The long term okay. vision. You got to go to it Lawrence is. next year. So no, he's got. He's <laughs> that's got. That's the deal breaker. He's got till then, no question about it. I agree with that. But um, the the question is, does your blue is your blueprint? You know, what I mean, is your is your blueprint a successful one? It's to be is determined. It we don't yeah. know. And we don't not, know. We don't know if it, based everything's working. Based on the working. data, he doesn't want Gerard Hurd at court. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm just spitballing here, but I think this is if, if the attrition goes kind of the way it's looking like it's going to go. It's going to go. I think that that's way. kind of what Tom Herman's saying. You know what? If they, if they want to leave, that's fine. Okay. Anybody that wants to transfer out, we'll give them releases. Let's just restock the cupboard with our guys and build this thing up to where two years from now. We've got all of our guys in here. Like this that junior un- class right now that yeah. are all leaving early from that, Charlie when he did this exact same thing. That only that understand our culture yeah. and our With way. Of, that only understand mm-hmm. our culture and our way of doing things. Yeah. That's the group we're going to go win. Okay. With. It's just Charlie didn't ride that momentum because we talked about how horrible that offseason is. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong right with that. Now. If that's what he wants to do, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just no. saying, we saw the last guy drew that. 
And it's a gamble. It's a gamble. It's yeah. a big gamble. It's a gamble. Just don't and it could either pay off really big or we could be going through another coaching search in three years. Yeah, sure. I don't know. But I think that's where this is headed. So I think Texas fans just need to kind of buckle up and hang tight and see what happens over the next 18 or so months. It'll be a hell of a ride. All right, Matt, let's do some picks before we get out of All here. All right, who you got this week? Stanford, USC. This is the Pac-12 championship game. Uh, I'm going to go USC. All right. Uh, I'm going USC as well. Yeah. yeah. I am as well, sticking with the favorite. What about an Auburn and Uga over there in Ooh, Georgia? Auburn. I'm going Auburn, You man. know what? In the rematch, because I need to catch up on games with you guys, give me Georgia. Okay. All rematch. right. I'll yeah, you Auburn. lost a game to Rod and I last week. Now moving on, Clemson, Miami. Who you got? I'm going with Auburn, by the way. Um, Clemson, Miami. Uh, Clemson. I'm going to go Clemson. Yeah, I just I'm don't think Miami is going to be able to move the ball enough. Against yeah. Yep, we're on the same page. It's like a 10-point favorite though. there, too. That's the one big one. Damn. Now. Yep. Oh, it big started one. at five all the way to nine and a half wow. now. But, yep, Ohio State, Wisconsin. Who you got? Ohio State. I know. I should take Wisconsin, but I'm taking Ohio State. I'll you know take what? Urban Meyer. I need to catch up a game on you guys. I like Ohio State better, but give me Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah. I I'll like take Urban the Meyer. seven-point favorite, Ohio State. And then moving on, going to be Oklahoma versus TCU. Wisconsin creates series. more playoff chaos, right, if Wisconsin wins? Yeah. No, they're in. They're just in. You if think they, so? Right, yeah. Wisconsin just in. They're undefeated. They're just in. Oh, if I thought you were talking about if, they, if they're in already, we yeah. don't lose. If um, they, no, if they know if they win. Yeah, give me in. Wisconsin, man. I'll stick with Wisconsin. Um, a T, I'll take Oklahoma. If TCU wins, that's chaos. Yes. Yeah, get, give me Oklahoma. Yeah, I'll take I'm Oklahoma. sticking with the Sooners. Baker. All right, let's go Georgia and let's go Wisconsin. I there need to make go. up some games. I like chaos, though, man. There you go. All yeah. right, Matt, thanks for everything, man. You are more than welcome. Rod B, appreciate the time and the knowledge. Anytime, brother. Anytime. For Matt, for Rod, for Travis, the best damn videographer in the podcast game. For everybody at 104.9 The Horn, the Austin Radio Network, our radio partner, hornfm.com, the Horn app, AM 1260, 104.9 FM, our wonderful radio partner where you can hear me. I'm on uh, with Chad and Kevin on Thursdays. You can get the Longhorn Blitz on our SoundCloud page. And thanks to Matt, you get us on iTunes, tune in, any podcast app. Yep, just type in Longhorn Blitz. For the Horn family, for the Horns 24-7 family, I'm Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening, and we will catch you again on the next episode. You've been listening to Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Remember, for the latest Longhorn news 24-7, visit Horns247.com.